Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's such a sort of a pleasure to be here, and um, a really special evening uh, for me in so many, so many ways. Um, Edouard Louis is a, is, is a writer who's obviously uh, an extraordinary phenomenon in France, um, and I, I think I know, obviously, destined to be one of the great writers of, of French literature for many, many years to come. Um, but this book in particular, means so much to me, and I'm attached to it in lots of different, very complicated and quite strange and unexpected ways, which we might talk about later if, um, if we have time. Um, but as I'm aware that a lot of you might not have, uh, probably not read the book, I think we ought to start with a bit of an introduction. Um, the book is called The End of Eddie, and it opens with an incredible scene. In, in fact, it opens with um, an astonishing first line, um, and then opens with a scene of a young boy at school being really quite viciously attacked by his schoolmates. And that boy is Eddie. Um, Edouard, who is Eddie? Can you explain to us a little bit who is Eddie? Yeah, uh, hello, thank you for coming. That's adorable. <laughs> um, is it okay with the sound? Like, I can hear something strange, like, boo. No, <laughs> um, no so yeah, uh, Eddie what was the name that my parents gave me uh, when I was born. Uh, so I could say that e Eddie Belgel was me, but at the same time, uh, like, I could say that Eddie was the kid that I never succeed to be, you know, like because this name was Eddie, which is an American name. And, and in France, uh, the very poor people mostly give American names to the yeah. kids. So I was Eddie, but my cousins were like Brandon, Brian, Dylan, Jefferson, Jason, uh, Ocean, uh, for the girls, Melissa and and and, and Belgo is a very like tough name, uh, which means like pretty mug or like pretty face, but in a very difficult, harsh kind of slang. I, I think it, we, uh, it, it merits a bit of a discussion over the name because the original title is On finir avec Eddie Belgel. Uh, you had to put an end to Eddie Belgel. Tell us a little bit more about what kind of... So in the book, um, people, when Eddie goes to an audition uh, and the name is announced, people laugh at it because it has that quality that marks him out as coming from a very particular social class. Yeah, because so the, the, the name was that socially marked uh, and I, I, I was saying that I, I, I never succeeded in fitting in this name because this name was this like very popular, popular name, this very masculine name that actually my father gave me because he wanted me to reproduce his own masculinity. My father desperately wanted a strong, tough boy. And, and, and I don't know why, I was born this little gay queer child with a high voice, with a like feminine body language. And as soon as I was born, it was already too late, you know? And my parents told me, why are you like this? Why do you? Why do you bring shame on our family? Uh, everybody in the village is mocking us, you know, because of you. Why are you doing it? And so during all my childhood, and that the process that I described in the book, I did all my best to, to be this name. And I never succeeded, never. Because, because this village was a, was a very, you know, like kind of a very like small village in the north of France where 20 years ago uh, there was, used to be a factory where mostly all the men would work. And one day the factory closed and suddenly all the people there became like jobless and, and hopeless. And, and, and of course because the people were excluded from everything, excluded from school, excluded from the access to legitimate culture, everything ex excluded from having money, at the end, the only thing that body left to us was the body. Yeah. And when you just have the body, you end up creating an ideology of the body, an ideology of the strengths of the masculinity. And that was, it, it was so important for my father, just because that's the only thing that the world could left us, just this. 
a lot of the novel is about uh, it's set entirely in this in this village in the north of France, and it's about cycles and, and circles of violence, how violence reproduces itself. So you talked just about uh, masculinity and how masculinity is a form of pride, but it's also something that all the men, all the boys, live under huge pressure to live up to. Now, it's one of many cycles, many different types of violence. What are some of the other types? Can you explain? Like, there are kind of like uh, an homophobic violence and a masculine domination and, and also racism. Mm. All my family was voting from the Front National since ever. Which is in fact uh, how the, the village in general votes, it's not just your family. Yeah, everybody can check, it's like on Google, like 50%, more than 50% of the people vote for Marine Le Pen. And I promise you that if the people that don't actually vote would go to vote, they would vote for Marine Le Pen. So it's probably around like 70% or something like this. But what was interesting for me with all these violences, the homophobic violence or, or the violence of the masculinity or everything, it was that all these violence are linked together, you know? And you can't understand uh, homophobia or masculine domination if you don't understand the, the, the social class inequalities, for example. Absolutely. Because, like, everything was shaped by masculinity. Even, even to be a man of the working class meant to be like a, a real man who don't cross his legs like the man from the bourgeoisie does, a man that eats a lot and not like little foods like the bourgeoisie does. And so even, even you know, like the class struggle was a struggle for masculinity. Yeah. The, the boys, they would, they would disobey, disobey at school and they would challenge the professor. So then they would exclude themselves from school because it was the way of building your, your masculine identity. But at know? the same time, continuing that circle of exclusion and violence because by getting themselves excluded from school they then make themselves even less part of, of any kind of normal society. And even the women, talk a little bit about the women in the novel, even the women are slightly masculine. Um, a woman sort of, um, the women are tough in the novel um, and they're expected to be tough I and mean, they have no choice. Yeah, because of course the, 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 the norms of masculinity are, are easy for all the people, included for the women. And, and, and when my mother would go vote for Marine Le Pen, she would say, oh, I love Marine Le Pen because she has balls, you know, and because she represented something kind of masculine. Mm. And, and, and so more and more today, you, you, you can hear people telling, oh, the problem with the contemporary world is that we focus too much on identity politics. We talk about sexuality, we talk about race, we talk about gender, but we don't talk about class anymore. And that's obviously such a st stupid thing. Because you, you of course, when, when you look closer, you, you see what we were saying, that, that everything goes together, everything uh, works the same way, you know. One of the, the, the big presences in, in the novel um, to which everyone defines themselves against the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie exert this huge presence, even though the working class, uh, the village is incredibly working class, there's a lot of talk about the bourgeoisie. And as a, as a reader who comes from outside uh, France, it's often easy to stereotype France as, um, as being really Paris-centric. And part of the reason I think the novel was so, um, so talked about in France was that it brought to light you know, the way people live in huge parts of France um, that even the Paris elite aren't aware of. Um, a lot of the, the furious argument, the, the polemic against the, the novel when it first came out centered on, on whether or not um, the events of the book were actually true. And, and I think, in a sense, this is... It's such a red, it's such a sort of, um, it's a distraction. It's not something that's particularly relevant. But can you talk a little bit about that, how you reacted to um, the debate as to whether or not the novel is, was real or authentic? Yeah, like, you know, I always have this impression that, that the world we live in is a world full of lies and full of fiction, you know? It's the reason why uh, Chelsea Manning was put in jail, or why uh, uh, Julian Assange was uh, prosecuted, or, or Edward Snowden, was because they revealed how the governments lied, you know? And, and you see this kind of lies everywhere. 
And so when I started to write the, the end of Eddie, I felt that I wanted to, to say something, something true, something real. And even, you know, when I sent the manuscript to a bunch of publishers in Paris, some of them refused the, the book in saying, oh, nobody will believe it. Nobody will, will, will buy this story, as we say in English. And they didn't realize how violent it was. Because, of course, one of the main issues for the people of my childhood, for me, for my mother, for my father, was that we would always be dismissed as fictional people. We didn't exist. And my mother was saying every day, we don't count for other people. We don't exist. We are, we are, we are meaningless mm -hmm. to the other people. And, and that's one, it was the core of the violence. And even if my mother would say that gay people and Arabs should go to concentration camps, she was tremendously like racist and everything. But at the end, the reason why she would vote for the Front National was mostly because of it. Mostly because she felt like she was telling me, but Marie Le Pen is the only one who talks about us. And, and, and so that's why when I started to, to write, I, 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 could, I, I I was not able to write fiction. Like truth was so, such an it's emergency. It's very fundamental to the yeah. book. I had to do. It. I had to tell the people, look what you look how people live and what are you doing against it. But I find it's it, even the the, the the very act of questioning the, no, the novel's authenticity. I think it is something that um, mar the people, the writers who come from. Um, not the dominant group are subject to. I mean, as an as a as an Asian writer, I get this all the time. Uh -huh. um, is it really like that in Asia? You know, is it really uh, uh, is that really how people live? Is that is that true? Is that authentic? And that's something that basically, um, you know, white bourgeois people don't. No, no one ever asks anyone whether uh, details of a tea party in North London are true. People just <laughs> take it. They just you know they just assume it's Clearly. it's real. But. Somehow, it, it, it matters when, it, it's, you know, when you come from a really sort of deprived background or, or, or background that isn't, it doesn't occupy the, kind of the, the dominant terrain. Yeah, like, when, as you say, when I arrived in Paris and I, I saw all these women uh, in the center of Paris dressed in Chanel, they seemed unreal to me. They yeah. seemed like caricature, you know. And all the, what was for me like striking and unfortunately interesting with these journalists going to the village was that, you know, as if violence was so easy, as if violence was so uh, uh, obvious, and what, yeah. Yeah, what, what were they expecting? They were expecting to see like crucified gays in the street and pro Le Pen demonstration or like Arabs being bullied in the street. Of course, that doesn't make sense. And when, when I, for me, writing Hedy, writing The End of Hedy, was kind of a, of a way of making visible all this violence that was invisible during yeah. my childhood. This is one of the tragedy of violence, is that violence is so often invisible. Absolutely. If you, if you ask my mother, why did you stop school at 16? She will tell you, oh, because you know, school was not my thing. She, she won't tell you, because it's because I am a woman in the working class. It's because a school excluded me because I couldn't fit in the scholar system. She, she won't tell you because my, my, my husband didn't want me to work, because my father didn't want her to work, he would tell her a woman has to stay home. Or well, simply that and her mother and her grandmother, and her grandmother no one, so again. she belongs to a long tradition. She's just following what is inevitable. Yeah, and she would say, you know, I can't complain. My life is not so bad. And like, how can we fix the world we live in? if the people who are suffering don't say we are suffering. So writing the end of Eddie was me for it was to give a voice to all this mm. pain that is never told, you know. Yeah, because I think people get normalized. They they sort of become habituated to um, that suffering and that violence. And they to the extent that they don't even feel that it, it it's it's um, it's normal anymore. So if you, if you look at if you take that comparison and, and, and look at other parts of the world where you know, extreme poverty and corruption, for example, you know, political corruption, extreme political like corruption, you where, about. Yeah, like, yeah, where I'm from, um, is so normal that no one even thinks that it, it's unusual anymore. Um, <coughs> and people will often say things like, well, I think, um, I think that our politicians are rotten because they've stolen, this one person's stolen $10 billion. Well, actually, if he'd just taken one, it's fine. And you know that one is not fine. Um, rather, like in this village, people have got used to a certain way of living, and they can't see 
life being any different anymore and, and cycles are reproduced. It's interesting also that a lot of the accusation or a lot of the anger that people felt in France um, came from the village and, and, and Parisian journalists were very keen to try and find sources of that anger. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, it was not only the French people, like El Pais went to the village as well from Spain and some other from Germany and some other from... Because at the end, like, the world is the same everywhere, you know, I face... You, people always have the impression that social class are not in their country, you know. I would go to Norway and they say, oh, that's very interesting, your book. We don't have so much social class in our country, yeah. but... I would say, but you know, I was in the hotel and there was someone cleaning the toilets. Don't you call it social class, you know? Someone who is, who is washing your shit, like cleaning it, like... And, and so, because it's the same thing in France. You know, for 20 years we had people saying uh, social class don't exist anymore, social class don't exist anymore, social class don't and, exist And France is, is very successful at, at, at sort of producing this image. Yeah, of course, because there is there is kind of a representation of what France is and what French society is. Mm. But the question we have to ask is, whenever you talk about France or whenever you talk about French people, what, who are you talking Absolutely. about? For so long, when we would say American citizen, we were only talking about white people because the black people didn't have the right. They didn't have the right to access a lot of things, voting. And, and now when we say France, it means uh, not my mother. It means not my father. And we felt it when I was a kid. And, and now they are having their revenge, you know, in going to vote for crazy, awful people. No, ab absolutely. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary you're saying about uh, Baïs and all these other, sort of, the Norwegian newspaper going to this tiny village in the, in the north of, of France, which is, um, you know, totally unknown. It's, it's just become, it's become, a, you know, an international destination. Um, <laughs> Talk us through a, a little bit more about, about um, something I'm really interested in that you just mentioned, about, about how class, talk of class makes people feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> and one of the big things in, in The End of Eddie, which you then go on to discuss um, in, in much more sort of um, power and detail in your second novel, Histoire de la Violence, is what happens when when people become moved from one class to the other by virtue of education, for example, when they become um, a class transfuge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like about social class, there is something very, very important that I try to explain it, but it's kind of difficult. When I, when I started to write The End of Heavy, I had the impression that when people were talking about social class and poor people, post-industrial, like, working class, they would either be contemptful to these people, oh, look how funny they are, look how poor they are, or they would, like, create a mythology of the working class, like the working class as being, like, more authentic, more yes, uh, 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 simple, yeah. like, the real life, the things that you, you can find in, in the work of, of Pasolini or in the work of Jean Genet or in the works of Ken Loach. And, and I had the impression that these two perceptions, I say it in, um, I, I admire so much Pasolini and mm -hmm. all of them, of course, but still I had the impression that they were part of the same system. You know, it was kind of, oh, look at the good savages, you know? And plus it was... Yeah, the noble savage is, is, a, way of, is a way for the bourgeoisie to deal with the existence of that, of that class. Yeah, of that and then you, you don't talk about women, you don't yeah. talk about queer people, you don't talk about, uh, do you know when people talk about the solidarity of the working class, when they vote, like in my village, more for 50% for the Front National, so we talk about the solidarity again, among white people. And, and plus, of course, when I, I, when I write, I, I'm fighting. If for me, writing is a struggle for, the, for, for, for my family, for these people, for the people who are invisible, for the people. Are, but it's not because you fight for someone that you have to love someone. You know, actually, I, I don't know if I love, I don't know, my brother or something. But it doesn't mean that I w don't want no, to fight actually, yeah. for him because it's kind of objective reasons why I want to fight for him. If he is lovable or not, it's not. You know, it's not my business. This is the thing. I think one of the reasons the book is so powerful is that it has this sort of 
um, this really kind of um, excoriating effect. It's really sort of, um, it's really violent. It doesn't hold back anything, but it also, in some way, it feels almost like a love letter at times. It feels like a celebration of of something, and I'm not quite sure what that something is. It feels like you, know, you wanted to fix in this book um, something, you know, mm. record something really important. Um, you, you've since left the village. Uh, Eddie, at the end of uh, the end of Eddie, sees you leaving the village to go to uh, Elysee in Amiens, which is the regional capital, about forty-five minutes away. Um, and then <coughs> after after that, you went to. Uh, uh, the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Um, Fortunately, for very uh, you escaped. How does you know prestigious, the sort of the the, the bastion of, of, of French letters um, and scholarship? How how did that influence the way you wrote and what you wanted to write? And how did that influence the way people talked about you, both in the village and um, in the press afterwards? Yeah. It, it was it it was difficult because you know at that time I would introduce myself to people and and it was before I went to court to change my name so I would say oh my name is Eddie Belgel and people would laugh all the time and they would tell me oh but that's fantastic and it's such a cute name that's such a cute cute name name, and I would say them okay if you if you think it's that you (laughs) can take it and of course nobody wanted and and so the thing was you know. Most of the time, when people were talking, were pretending to talk about uh, the poor people, they were only talking uh, about the distance that they have with the poor people. Like when they love, they pretend to love Eddie Belgel as a name, but they love the distance that they have with it, you know? And so when I started to write the book, I, I thought, okay, I have to be careful of not writing the distance but write the people as such, what they life, what they're feeling, what the, the, the pain that they enjoy, you know, and not, not the distance like this, write it's the language. Really, it's a really remarkable feature of the book that even though obviously you wrote it when you'd already left the village and acquired education, very high level of education, the book feels as if it's written from the inside. It feels very much, to me at least, um, very much an organic part of the village. Because I started to write the book at... at 18 and I think I, I read the f- almost the first book of my life at 17 uh, because when I was a kid we hated the books you know we 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 didn't only like refuse to read we hated them because what they, they were, symbolized yeah exactly the, because they there was a symbol of educated people the, the symbol of the life we would never have and for that, we hated them so deeply. And plus, it was considered something like feminine to read, you know? Yeah. It was for pussies, my father would say, to read books. And so even if at some point I, I, I left the village and wanted to live another life, I kept this feeling and this suspicion towards book for a long, long time. And it was, I would say, like, like my brother would say, I would say, oh, books are boring, you know? And, and when I started to read, at, at, at 17, I suddenly I wanted to I wanted to read everything, and it was difficult because be, before before I didn't read, so I I was so bad I, I I didn't understand anything. I would read Toni Morrison or William Faulkner or James Baldwin, and, and I would cry because I I didn't understand anything, and but after I would again I, I was thinking I have to go on again and again, and I started to write, and as you say, it was very close from this experience and very close from this this failure because for me the, the failure to become a tough guy a tough guy a tough yeah. to live guy. up to to eddie belgeul yeah. the name and who he's supposed to be yeah because you know i i said it a lot but because for me it's the core of the one of the most important thing of the book i wanted to show that Eddie, the kid I, I used to be, was was not a different child. Mm. I was racist. I, I I was afraid of black people in the street. I was homophobic. I was because I would reproduce what I what I heard. And 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 for me, when I at the end of the book, I I am I leave the village. If at that time you you came and you told me 
okay, either you go to school and you will be the first to study and you will live in Paris or you stay in the village and you are like the king of soccer and, 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 and the boys that like hang out with all the girls. I would have not hesitated and I would have stayed. For me, it was just a terrible failure to, to have to go. And it was such a trauma at the beginning. I, 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 I didn't want. And I, I, I thought that writing the book this way was so much more <coughs> important. Because if you say Eddie was not different, but he became different, then you open a door and, and, and you say, OK, we can create difference. It's not like, it's not like Billy Elliot, yeah. or it's not like mm. uh, uh, Julien Sorel in uh, yeah. Le Rouge et le Noir, or it's not like, it's not that this fantastic, always, yeah, but the cl- already Yes, it's the very kids. reverse. It's, it's you know, Eddie's trajectory, his story is, is the reverse of, of so many of the classic stories of this model in which a very brilliant child knows he's different, mm-hmm. always thinks he's different, and it's just a matter of time before he, he needs to get out. What Eddie experiences is the very reverse. He feels that what makes him different is actually a failure, and he tries to overcome that by becoming Eddie Baker with more and with greater and greater, greater failure. And then, such and a failure. <laughs> in fact, I'm not um, the tough guy you wanted to be. Um, the, the French title, En finir avec Eddie Baker, is, is more pointed. Why did you, at what point did you feel you had to, you had to just finish him? Um, sorry. Thank you. Like, yeah, it was for me a way of, of saying, finally, I want to uh, put a hand to Hedy because long before I wanted to put a hand, it was my family that wanted to put a hand to what I was and all, all, the, all the whole milieu. So I wanted, a, I wanted a, yeah, like a radical, strong title. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I, 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 I proposed this title to my, to my publisher and as soon as we get closer to the publication date, I was suddenly so afraid of, because I was, for years in my life, I was so ashamed of this name. I, I, I was doing everything to hide it, you know. I had so much strategies. Don't use your credit card with someone because it will see the name. Uh, don't do anything. At some point, I had a boyfriend who wanted to take me on vacation, and I desperately wanted it, but I ne- he needed my, my, uh, my ID. ID. And so I said, oh, no, I'm not interested in going to vacation because I wanted to. I, I couldn't tell him that my yeah. real name on my ID at that time was Eddie Belgel. And so when the book was uh, about to be published, I called my publisher. I said, no way. We don't keep this title. We will call it Insurrection, for example. And my uh, publisher told me, oh, it's so banal. I said, I don't mind. I want it's Insurrection really on really nothing. Bad. <laughs> and because it reminded me like Thomas Bernhardt, uh, Perturbation, ex- yes. extinction, extinction, everything. Extinction, yeah. And it, I love so much Thomas Bernhardt. But, and, and, and my publisher fought against me. And he was right, even if it's not so good to fight against your writers for the publishers here. But, uh, but that time he was really. Right, but there is a sense throughout, not just I mean in, in in the title certainly, but throughout the whole book, there's a sense of a writer fighting, almost for the the right to write this. There's too many rights in that sentence, but a writer fighting to let his text speak, um, and it feels as if you've had to overcome. Feel lots of it's very very personal. It's very private. Um, it's very revealing, and I think the truth of the realness of it makes it oftentimes read very uncomfortably. Um, I'm going to have you read um, in a second uh, just a small passage before we open up to questions. Um, But maybe you could just sort of tell us a little bit about how difficult it was. Was it difficult to write the novel? Yeah, as you know, it's always difficult to write a novel and, but yes, certainly it was because, uh, because I was dealing with like very personal facts and, and with like intimate things. And, and plus like, I, I didn't want people to perceive me as a victim, you know? I didn't want people to see me on the street as the guy who was bullied at school. And the, this was such a difficult thing because, <laughs> At the same time, uh, we, were, we were talking about it, the, the people who suffer and, and don't say it, you know, yeah. the people who don't succeed 
uh, in saying I am a victim of violence. Uh, this is true, and at the same time, you don't want to be considered as a victim. So you you have to deal with it. And to when I hear people talking, for example, about uh, victimization, it frankly just disgusts me. You know, like so much as as if the problem in the world we live in was that the people were telling too much, I am a victim. You know, victimization means plenty of people saying victim. When in fact, when you consider the masculine domination, the racism, the homophobia, the poverty, the colonization, the post-colonization, you, you can think like, with all this violence, why is it so difficult for people to say, I am a victim of something? So the problem is not victimization, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. That's what the feminist movement say at the beginning, why? a woman who was assaulted and raped can't say I am a victim. And so in the end of it, like the difficult thing was to, to, to not be afraid of that, to not be afraid of this voice coming from the future who would tell me, isn't it victimization? Or, or you have a silly word in English, which is misery memoir. And misery memoir. <laughs> that I hate so much because, and because it's so, it doesn't mean anything, first. Second, it's so pejorative. And every day when you go to the bookshop, you see so many bourgeoisie memoirs. And nobody will say, oh, it's bourgeoisie memoir with, with, a, with a pejorative term. So it's only when it's the poor people who write We do, we about... do. Oh, yeah, some people do. <laughs> yeah, OK, you are clever. And <laughs> well, other people here, too, I guess. Uh, but, but, but when I heard this te term for the first time, I was, it made me so crazy, you know? So, so when but I think that's talking... also another way in which the system uh, marginalizes certain books written by certain people who come from certain backgrounds. They, it, it sort of pushes them to the margin, to the margins even further, and, and, and diminishes their importance because it's yeah. just a misery memoir. Um, I mean, it's such a it's such a terrible term. Um, I was gonna. I w would like to ask you also about um, about just the the combination of of the incredible sort of um, personal emotion, really powerful sort of. Um, just powerful emotional reflections on the page, combined with very, um, very clear-sighted or sociological um, observations of the village. Um, because you're um, a great disciple of Pierre Bourdieu, the sociologist, and, and a sociologist by training, uh, is, 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 that's certainly part of your formation. Um, how, how has Bourdieu been important to you? Uh -huh. but when I read Bourdieu, uh, who means everything to me, with Toni Morrison. Uh, it made me, it, no, I just realized so many things. And, I, and particularly, I realized that all the things that I would consider as, as, as personal when I was a kid were in fact like politic, were collective, were a matter of, of society. Even, even, even when Eddie is crying in the courtyard because he's, uh, uh, th these two guys assault him and, and treat him as faggot and everything, like, I realized that even the tears were politic, you know, because they are allowed by a, a political context, a sociological context, a certain history of homophobia in a certain country and a certain time, and that everything was like this. And, and just when I was a kid, I would... I hated my parents, I hated my mother, I hated my father, because I was thinking, like, why, why, why is it not possible between them and me when it works for my brother and sister? And in, 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 in reading sociology and in writing The End of Eddie, I just, it allowed me to, to take a distance yeah. and to think they are not responsible. The people who are responsible are the people who exclude them. Uh, it's the, the, the system, it's the dominant people that don't do anything to help them. That's the real, like... And so I think to mix literature and sociology is a beautiful thing because, because literature is the, the most beautiful art of excuses, you know? Yeah. In Light in August, you have Joe Christmas, this guy who cuts the head off mm. of a woman, and then Faulkner talk about his childhood and how he endured the racism and how he endured the violence. And you, you can feel this throughout all the history of literature as an art of excusing the violence and finding the real causes for it. Absolutely. And, I mean, in, in the end of Eddie, it's, it's very pronounced, it's very clear. It, there's a sort of, it's a wonderful, at times, almost sort of, I would say, delightful sort of um, observation of, 
of taste, all the things that the people do, how, you know, the things they drink, um, the clothes they wear, the words they say, language is very important in, in, in this novel. Um, people speak as if they really do in real life, whereas to me, I think that part of the problem with a lot of contemporary French literature is people don't speak at all in, in, in <laughs> novels as if they do the, the way they do in real life. Yeah, they don't speak, they make other people shut even, like, yes, exactly. you know, like well back about women, like, yeah. <laughs> it's not only that they don't speak, it's that they have to shut up, and of course when you, when you start to write, you have to think, and I think that the thing you did with all your novels, uh, you have to think, who is silent, who is invisible? And my priority will be to talk about these people. Who has the, the other voice? Can wait. Who has the voice? Uh -huh. You know, who um, who's to whom am I giving voice uh -huh. in this novel? Okay. Um, we'd like to hear your voice if that's possible. Right. And then just a very very short passage, and then just we'll, ten lines. Just uh, yeah. <clears throat> Every morning in the bathroom, getting ready. I would repeat the same phrase to myself over and over again so many times that it ceased making any sense, becoming nothing but a series of syllables, of sounds. Then I would stop and start over again. Today, I'm going to be a tough guy. I remember it because I would always repeat exactly the same sentence in the same way as you repeat a prayer in the same words, the exact same words. Today, I'm going to be a tough guy. And now I am crying as I read this line. I am crying because I felt that sentence hideous and ridiculous. That sentence that went everywhere with me for several years. And I was, I don't think I'm exaggerating, at the center of my being. Thank you. Thank so you. Um, we have time for a good number of questions, I think. I wanted to ask you some more, more, more questions, but we will do another well, event. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. You choose, Tash. There, Could please. Could I ask how... Uh, could you use the microphone? Because then we'll put it back. Okay. Um, can I ask you how has uh, your success as a writer uh, affected your relations with your family, changed those re your relations with your family? Um, and how are you perceived by the community you grew up in and you talk about in your, in your book, which I haven't read, I haven't just heard about it. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was difficult uh, and it was, uh, uh, above all, it was mixed, first I would say. Like, people had different feelings, it depends on the people. But, uh, for, for example, my mother, let's talk about my mother. Uh, she went crazy, you know, she was very upset against me. And she went to all the TV shows, like the very big TV shows where I would never go, uh, you know, this kind of jokes TV show and everything. Uh, and she was saying, uh, everything is wrong. Not, nothing is true. My son is a liar. And she, and I've, I talked with her at that time. And the thing she told me was, why do you say that we are poor? And that was the thing that upset her, you know. And she said, we are not poor. And I was saying, but mom, we got 600 euros per seven people. We, we were poor. I, you can see on my website, I have pictures of the house that I put, that originally I wanted to put in the book. That was a poor house. You see the one meter hole in the, in the, in the, in the wall, yeah, like big, and the rain would come in the house. So it was poor. Like, and, but the system makes her believe so much that it's her fault she's, if she is poor, you know, that she feels guilty about it. And she don't want to be poor because she feels accused by it. So, of course, she, she was angry at the book. And plus, like, all the violence upon Eddie, upon the, the, the kid I used to be. Like, Eddie is not the matter. The matter is the Eddie of today because, you know, like, because there are a lot of them. Uh, but my mother, like, quite never told me, oh, you just a faggot or anything. She would tell me, uh, but why are you like this? You know, and it was so much more violent, but she didn't realize it. She was just asking a question. Why? Why are you that feminine? 
Why do you do that to us? Doesn't make sense. Stop doing it, you know? And, and so, of course, she didn't see herself in the book. And, and as a woman, she, she learned to fight, you know? She, it was the only way for her to survive. So, like, of course, I was upset that she went on TV to attack me. But at the same time, I was so happy to see her, like, fighting like this, even if it was not for her good sake, because she was saying things that are objectively against her. You know, the fact of not I saying, I, 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 I am not poor. I was not poor. It's, it, it won't help her. But, but so, yeah, it was like this. But on the contrary, my father uh, called me. And at that time, we, we didn't speak together in five years. Uh, and I was uh, 21, so it's well, a quarter of my life without talking to him. It was a lot. And uh, he told me, oh, Edward, uh, uh, dad is so proud of you. And he bought like 20 copies of the book. And he offered it, like, he's a street sweeper now, and he offered it to, to all his, his, his colleagues, you know. And he would like make copies of the articles and, and put the articles everywhere in the little rooms that they had for the street sweepers. Uh, and, and it was the first time of his life he would call me Eddie, uh, Edward, because before he would tell, no, your name is Eddie. You are what I choose. You are not, you are not Edward. What do you think? I, I choose your name. You don't change. And that time he told me Edward, and I was, wow. And, and so, and now he's not saying racist, thing, uh, racist things anymore and everything. It, it changed a lot. It's, you know, it's incredible. Uh, I can't explain, but yeah. At the end. I think the, the mother, like this is kind of, the reaction of my father is kind of anecdotic and cheesy, so it's not that interesting, but the reaction of my mother was, taught me so, many, so much more things, like, yeah. Oof, uh, was kind of the same, like some of them were like, more like my dad and some of them were more like my mother, but at least at least, the, at least, like even the one who hated me at that time, uh, even if I changed the name, I never put the name of the village in the book. I never put a single real name in the book. And the journalist uh, published the name of the village. I never did it. So I kind of protected them. Like, and and the, the media reveals the real name of the people. Who were the real names? They make like investigation and everything. Uh, um, but, but even the people who were upset at me, I, I saw it because I went on Facebook and everything, uh, and and I, I saw that uh, a, a lot of them were like they had a mixed feeling because they they were kind of I don't know how to say it, uh, but they were kind of happy to have someone who were talking about them, you know? Like it's strange to say it because it can seem arrogant. Like it not it's not because I wrote it that they felt good, but because someone finally was talking about them, and. Yeah, so I can't go there, of course. It would be too dangerous. But because when my book came out, my, my, fa my brother came with a baseball bat uh, in my street in Paris. So I had to live in a hotel for a while. And he told me, do you pretend I am violent? And I said, <laughs> what? Why did you write in your book, I am violent? And it was with a baseball bat in my street. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, <laughs> but <laughs> so it was. So no, I couldn't go there really. But yeah, that's the answer. It's it's interesting that of all the things that your mother was upset about, the thing that she was most angry about was be, was was being described as poor, uh -huh. and being racist, homophobic, and, and all the she rest of it. Just didn't really that came further down. Uh -huh. so. No, of course, because look at the media, look how they're mocking the poor people, look at all the things they do, and they say, of course, it's terrible. When they open even like supposedly, supposedly left-wing newspapers like Liberation, which is not left-wing since a long time, but, but look at how they talk about the working class. It's just terrible, terrible. Hi, thanks. I enjoyed the book very much. I mean, it's Thank a heartbreaking portrait of a kid in school. And I remember when I was in primary school, there was a little gay kid. And I'd just arrived in the school. I was only there a year. 
So there was a very ingrained culture of, already in the school when I arrived of bullying this child. And I was just flabbergasted. I'd never seen anything else before. But I really regret now that I didn't do anything about it. And you describe very well the culture among the children that is so separate from, you know, there's a child's world and there's an adult world. And there's the supervisor in the playground who is supposed to supervise, but actually doesn't see what's going on because there are all these codes and whatever among the kids. So I just wondered, what do you think children are supposed to do? Are children, for me, now I look back and I think, God, if I had this brain, I would have inter if I had my knowledge now, I would have intervened as a child. Do mm -hmm. you think that's really possible for children to do it, to intervene and protect their schoolmates? Oh, I know, Carlos. <laughs> uh, the problem, uh, the problem is, yeah, but what is difficult is like the people who are bullied, like like I was, like Eddie was, most of the time they are like, they are the more active in hiding what, what, what is going on. And I would, at that time I would do, I describe it in the book every day. I was doing all my best to, to just protect them because I was so afraid that, that someone would figure out. Uh, because I was, I was ashamed of being insulted, you know? I always wanted to make people believe that if they insulted me, it was not like real, like, and if I, I came to someone and say, uh, this person is, is telling me faggot, I would have confirmed the suspicion of the other people, you know? I wanted people to believe that they, they were the only one who would tell it to me, if they were like isolated. So, so that's the, I think the main issue, it, it, and it's linked to what we were talking about, is how do you do uh, to make people say that they are victim of violence? You know, how do you do for them to not be ashamed of being a victim of violence? And that's the whole work, I think. If, if we, yeah, we, we have to, to teach to people how beautiful it is to complain, you know? There was something during the French Revolution called Cahier de Doléances, and it was like books where people could complain about their life. And it was the first step to change the world, you know? And Karl Marx would say it's the first gesture of the lion before the lion jumps, you know? It's, it's to be ashamed and to say, I am ashamed of, 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 of my life. I am ashamed of, 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 because I am suffering. He's telling I am suffering, I am in pain. And as soon as we have people talking about victimization, miserabilism, all these kind of things, uh, we will, we will never, we will never do it. There was, a, there was a writer in Norway that actually can of wrote a book against me and against both of my novels, and because he said, oh, so I have to say, he's a straight white man, uh, and I don't care about straight white men. Pierre Bourdieu was a straight white man, and it was not his way of thinking. I'm just accusing the way of thinking, not, not the being. Uh, but he, he would tell, oh, I went to some villages in France and nobody talked about homophobia at all. And I said, but that's precisely the problem, you know, because people don't talk about it. He, and also, said I didn't, he also said I didn't see any gay people. He didn't, I, I didn't see any gay people, he said it. And, 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 Be and because it, I was too because busy. I was too busy watching the girls, he said, which was kind of disgusting. Uh, and <laughs> he said you are, you are he too busy that. chatting up it, the girls. <laughs> yeah, that's what the, the thing. And, and, and so, of course, as soon as you have all these discourses that make people shut, the people who are bullied, as you were pointing out, will, will never say anything. So change, change the, the public space, Ch change the feel of discourse, write articles against this kind of discourse, write books against it, talk to the people around you, Tell them how beautiful it is to complain, and, and it's, it won't be enough. But you know, when you do po something political, it's never enough. That's the definition of politics: is that you have to start again and again. But that's already something. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Oh, so I have a question about um, one of the aspects of your book, which is the rise of the Front National in, in the former mining regions of France, uh, where you're from. 
And as you, everyone is probably aware here, um, the popularity of Marine Le Pen is at a record high at the moment. The presidential election is happening in less than three months. And my question is, what's the alternative for the French working class than voting for Marine Le Pen? Who, who else than Marine Le Pen, unfortunately today, represents the French working class? Uh -huh. I'm sorry to be <laughs> no, 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 but no. It's, it's an enigma <laughs> for me as well. But um, I was wondering if you had any views about... No, I, I think that as, as, as Didier Eribon pointed out in his book, uh, Returning to Reims was <laughs> my biggest inspiration, was translated into English by uh, Semyon text. Uh, I think that one of the, like, the big, a big role in France was, and, and, in, and, in, and in Britain and, and, and in the United States, uh, was played by, by the left-wing people, by the supposedly left-wing people. Because they stopped talking about the poor people, they stopped talking about misery, they stopped talking about class, and then like people felt abandoned. And frankly, you you talk five minutes with my mother, and you, and and she told me that she's going to vote for Le Pen again. And you you talk you talk five minutes with her, and she will tell it to you. She will tell she will tell nobody care about us. And I will vote for her because she's the only one who talk about us. And it was just desperate fight to, to exist in the eye of the other, to exist in the discourse. And so as soon as there is no like left-wing space where we talk about people in poverty or people who suffer from domination, then they will try to find someone. They have an agency, you know? They will try to find someone who talk about them. At some point, someone pro uh, told me uh, that he wanted to make a documentary with me on the uh, Front National and uh, I told him, okay, we can do um, Histoire du Front National and the whole movie will be about the Socialist Party. Uh, <laughs> because like, you know, my, my, the, the parents of my parents uh, were voting for the left-wing parties. All these people, they were voting for the Communist Party because they felt that the Communist Party was talking about them. And, they, they, you know, so with the same determinism, I think that most of the people can switch very easily to one side or to another. But you just have to provide space. You just have to provide like, yeah, room for this kind of discourse. And 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 yeah, I'm too talkative, but and, and it, <laughs> I, there is so many things I want to uh, challenge and say. But uh, yeah, just just create space on the left. Stop being fascinated by uh, extreme right-wing people, you know? As soon as Marine Le Pen says something stupid, like, it's the cover of all the newspapers. And you have so many writers, you have so many <coughs> young politicians, or less young, but who have young ideas. You have so many artists, you have so many who have new things to say. And we take the space because of this fascination for extreme right-wing people. They are everywhere, all the time. Yesterday, the, the first page of The Guardian was about Marine Le Pen, and today it was about Trump. I was like, come on, like, so many people are providing new discourses. We, ne we need them, we need to hear them. And, and, and then, if people feel that other people are talking about them, maybe they will, maybe they will switch. It won't fix everything. It won't fix everything. Uh, even when the Communist Party was the first party of France, there was a lot of racism within uh, the, 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 the Communist Party. There are books written about it, like uh, Elisou la Vraie Vie, for example. Uh, uh, but at least this racism was secondary, you know. And with Marine Le Pen, it's become one of the main issues. And if it's secondary, it's not enough, but it's a first step to try to remove it and to make it disappear. There was a question here. Just there, just in front of you. Yeah, here. Hi. Um, I just wondered if you would be able to talk a bit about discovering Toni Morrison. Um, I read her when I was a queer <coughs> when I was a queer teenager, and I think she had a, a big effect on me as well. But I was wondering if that's something if that's something that you see in her work is being spoken to. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know what. When I met her, she told me, 
how is it possible then a white gay French boy born in the 90s is so like influenced by a black uh, American straight woman born in the 20s on the, or the late 20s or the beginning of 30s, maybe 29, I don't, I don't remember exactly. And this is exactly this precisely in reading her books about the suffering of black people in, in the United States more, uh, most of the time. I, I, I understood so many things about the suffering of the people of my childhood or the working uh, French working class, lower working class, or the gay people. As if you know, I just it, it allowed me to, 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 to take a step back, to make a distance, you know, when, when, uh, like when you are on a plane, you know, and suddenly you see, okay, there is the city here, there is the, the mountain, there is the river, there is... And this kind of distance, because precisely we are so different, allowed me to, to kind of see the structures of domination, the big structures that shaped our life. And, and for that, it was, yeah, uh, amazing and, and very important. And there are so many other things that I could say about her work, but this was like, yeah, very important. We probably have time for one more, qu one more question. Do we have time? Yes, there's in the corner. Thank you. Um, we, I've, I teach your book as part of a course on um, French language and contemporary society. I'm here with um, some of my students, um, and I'd like to ask you. <laughs> I'd like to ask you. Um, Oh, yeah, you did an amazing tweet, isn't it? <laughs> I saw yeah, that it. was us, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I just wanted to ask you about the, the way you use the French language. In, we, haven't, we haven't looked at the translation yet. We've, we've been doing our own translating as part of the course. Um, but the, the thing about the French version is that the, there's, there's two different, very distinct registers of language. So there's the vulgar um, language of the inhabitants of the village, which is in italics. And then there's your educated, very formal, beautiful French, which is the, in, in standard type. Um, I don't know whether that's been reproduced in the translation, but I wondered whether, well, I wondered how you reconcile those two registers with what you were saying earlier about the lack of distance, because for us, well, for me, it feels like there's a huge distance linguistically mm -hmm. between the two elements. So. Yes, obviously, uh, these languages are, are my two languages, you know? I am kind of bilingual, and especially when I'm very angry, I can speak the, the language of my childhood like very fast, like this. Uh, but also I wanted to, I wanted to show that the, the language of my childhood, the language of my mother, the language, my language when I was a kid, is a language that can talk about the reality as much as, 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 a, as a more like, I don't know, bourgeois or more traditionally literary language. And, and, and precisely when I, I started to write, I was thinking, okay, if you write, you have to ask yourself what, like, what literature is excluding in order to be considered and perceived as legitimate literature. And for a long time, it was black people. And then there were like Zorani Lurston or James Baldwin or Toni Morrison who wrote and who by force included the black people into a literature, you know? And I was thinking, what is now excluded? And I thought that it was the, the language of my childhood, you know? Because when you, like, when you talk about style in literature and a word that I don't like so much, but when you, you talk about style, then it's, it means um, a, la a language that is not like the common language. And if you push it further, it's a language that it's not like the folk's language. You know, it's, it has to be different. It, ha it has to have this kind of distance. And, and I was thinking, OK, I will take this language and put it in the center of my book and build it with two languages, one which is more like my language of today and one with, with, like my language of my childhood, and, and to, to show how this language like, you know, fight against each other and how like they collapse like this and create this kind of 
explosion. And I, actually, the, the part about the, the, the popular vernacular was the hardest part to write because it's such, there is such a difficult rhythm and so many, so many metaphors, you know. My mother would never call something by its real name. She would have a metaphor for everything, everything. And so I wanted to, I wanted to show that. And, but in the same time, and that's the last thing I say, but in the same time, I didn't want to, to mythify this language, you know, because you can say, oh, this language is like metaphoric and beautiful, and this is a language of the contemporary tragedy, you know, my mother is Antigone, and, but, but at the same time, th this, this language is produced by exclusion, you know, so it's not that beautiful. It's the la my, my mother or my father or I would speak this language be before because uh, we were excluded from school, because we would only watch TV. We, I watched TV like seven hours a day when I was a kid, and like all my family did and everything. And this is because of the exclusion that they are, this language. So I had to, to put it in the center and to, to show that it, it can talk about reality like every other language, but at the same time, not like, yeah, make it like beautiful and, and yeah, you don't, there's no romanticization of it. I mean, it straddles the line all the time. It, it's non-judgmental about which of the languages takes priority. I think it, they're both incredibly sort of well handled. Um, there's so much more I think we can talk about. Um, like, <laughs> but I think, I mean, my I haven't watch is saying, I mean, if someone would like a re I'm, I unfortunately do, and um, <laughs> uh, for a change. But if someone has a burning question they'd like to ask, otherwise I think you can, Edouard is here for questions as he signs books. One more. Oh, uh, one more oh. burning question. <laughs> How is this bilingualism, you call it, handled in the English translation? Uh -huh. Uh, uh, actually, I, I, I have the chance of having a very good translator, uh, Michael Luce, who is uh, working at the University of Berkeley and, and, and who knows very well like in French literature and class issues. He is working both on literature and sociology. So he managed to get it, you know, like even of course there are differences. Uh, there are some things that are not, we can't translate them, you know, because they are so, but the thing for a good translation is to, the, the revolution of Pierre Bourdieu in his book, Distinction, was to show that the class inequalities are not due to a certain amount of money or a certain practice or certain habits, but it was due to the distance between the habits and between the lobbies, and between the thing you do every day. And so this thing might change all the time, but what stays is the distance at the end. You know, like 20 years ago, the, the, the kids of the working class wouldn't go to high school. Now they do. But since they go to high school, uh, kids of more privileged family go further, go to university, or go to Ivy League university and everything. So the structure is changing, but the distance is always here. And Michael Luce, in the translation, he really understood it, that it doesn't matter if you can translate a sentence. What is a sentence? Like, a sentence is nothing, uh, you know, against more important issues. And he managed to keep the distance between, between the language. And I think he did a very, very good job. Yeah, really. Good, well, I think. Round of applause, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much.